हेलो वेलकम टू बी आई एफ एफ ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी बॉलीवुड इंटरनेशनल फिल्म फेस्टिवल ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी में आप सभी का तहे दिल से स्वागत है आज के हमारी मेहमान हैं बहुत ही खास ब्रिटिश जुश एक्ट्रेस प्रोड्यूसर डिरेक्टर एंड द सोशल एक्टिविस्ट लेजली वुड वेन यस एंड नमस्ते जी नमस्ते बिफोर दैट वी हैव अनादर होस्ट नीता कैंपस प्लीज वेलकम नीता कैंपस Hi, great. Your your voice is not coming. Hi, Nita. Great fun. It's an animation voice. <laughs> there is something happening technically with the sound and your voice is coming out sounding like a gorgeous duck in an animation <laughs> yes <coughs> try again no same thing <laughs> you can leave and come again yes try again So how's the things Leslie? Not too bad. I'm I'm calling today from London. Uh we're about to go into lockdown. We've just heard the news that the prime minister who always does things too late in this country <laughs> is going into another lockdown. We would have gone into a lockdown 8 months ago and we wouldn't be in this position but there you go that's politicians for you. Yeah. Yes. Am I audible now? Yes. yes. Very very audible. Welcome. Okay. She is another host, Nita Campus. Hi, Nita Campus. Welcome. Hi. Our, Hi, Madhvi. Uh, Hi, Leslie. How are you? Uh, बहुत अच्छा है. धन्यवाद. बहुत अच्छा है. Like that. आपकी हिंदी सुन के बहुत अच्छा लगा. छोटी छोटी हिंदी बोलो बहुत सुंदर या नीता जी ये सपोज टू टॉक अबाउट लेजलिस जर्नी एंड द वे शी हैंडल द सब्जेक्ट देर फिल्म okay uh, east is east west is west and very prominent documentary daughters of india india's daughters india's daughters india's yes. daughter actually it looked at a particular case nirbhaya jyoti singh yes yes and uh, i seen your two films east is east west is west can you just talk about your journey and talk about your films sure east is east i always refer to as my first born film um until east is east i had before that uh and i produced east is east before that i had been an actor that's how i started life yes. um and I had actually made a couple of films but for television. Uh so the very first film I made was called uh Sitting Targets mm -hmm. and I acted in it but I also worked with the screenwriter to write the script and worked with the producer uh, a brilliant British producer called Mark Shivers uh mm -hmm. 
I learned the ropes. So Mark it took me on as a kind of mentee and was a, very much a mentor to me in the process of uh, Sitting Targets, which was a film for Granada Television. Um, so sorry, for the BBC. It was a BBC Screen okay. 2 film. And it was a film about my real life um, chronicles, I guess you'd say, um, adventures, sad, sad to say they were not positive adventures, with a criminal landlord in England, a man called Nicholas Van Hoekstraten, who basically used to take over buildings very cheaply because they had sitting tenants living in them, tenants you couldn't just get rid of. And so they were devalued. So he would buy them incredibly cheaply and then he would frighten the tenants out. So he would put a snake through a letterbox. He would throw a hand grenade through the front window. All mm. sorts of, uh, you know, terror tactics in order to get the tenants to get terrified and to leave. And uh, that's how he made his money because an empty property in those days was worth so much more than a full property. And... Uh, uh, there was a big profit incentive. Sadly, profit is what motivates much of the evil in the world, and this was no exception. Um, and I fought a big battle, two and a half years of fighting against him, uh, taking him to court, though that was a complete waste of time because the law, in many cases, just does not provide the redress that's required, as was the case here. Um, and ended up making a film to try and persuade uh, people to stand up in the face of um, such evil, uh, in that case, I think, psychopath um, um, criminal landlords. Mm -hmm. And so that was my very first film, but it was made for television. And then my next film released six innocent men from one of the greatest miscarriages of British justice that uh, there's ever been. Um, and uh, these six Irishmen were pretty much arrested because of pure racism in Britain yes. at the time. And um, because of a, a very elitist and um, closed legal system, the... We can't hear easily. So sorry, everyone. Am I back? I think that might have been my internet. Yes. <laughs> um, I made a film that basically released these six men from prison. Uh, it made it more embarrassing for the British government to yeah. release the men, sorry, to keep them in prison than to release them. And at that point they released them. And the reason they'd kept them in prison for 17 years, many of which years they knew these were the wrong men. They knew these men were innocent. Okay. But the image of the British system was so much at stake that they decided that was more important than the lives of these six innocent men. Disgraceful. Disgraceful. So I made a film uh, and that film freed them six months after the film was shown. It was one of my proudest moments ever where Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister of England and um, a pretty ghastly example of a woman trying to lead in male clothing. Yes. You know, a terrible Prime Minister who rolled back so much of uh, the gains that had been made in this country Right. Um, cruel, awful woman, awful. Um, well, she stood up in the House of Commons the morning after my film came out and uh, she was absolutely enraged, red-faced and said, we will not have trial by television in this country, which thrilled me because of course we did have trial by television, exactly that. And the men were released at last because this was a trial that the public could not deny these men were innocent. So, um, and then East is East was my, the very first feature film I ever made and it was written by the wonderful Ayub Khan Din, who's a brilliant, brilliant screenwriter. 
and it was uh, autobiographical. Um, I actually went to see a play reading of this of East Disease at the Royal Court Theatre in mm -hmm. London, where I had actually acted a great deal at the Royal Court. I had quite a relationship with it. Um, right. I went to see this reading and I just fell in love with this piece of work and I thought, oh my God, that yes. man, George yes. Khan, is my father. It's the same. We have the same father, even though my father is Jewish, yes. his father is Pakistani, same. Yes. Uh, yes. Universal film. So, uh, yeah, that was the very first film I ever made. And bingo, it hit the jackpot in many, many ways. Um, in, in, in the most important ways, actually, which are not money, not to do with the success of the film, not to do with the British Oscar that that film won, entirely to do with the fact that it brought together two communities in the UK. Communities against whom there had been real bigoted racism. And the Asian or South Asian communities in the UK, I promise you in those days, we're talking not that long ago, it's quite shocking, it's 1999. Yes. Honest to God, the Brits did not know the difference between an Indian and a Pakistani. They didn't know, they didn't care. There was real racism. When I was developing this film, East is East, with the BBC, again, BBC, I've worked three times with the BBC only. West because the language is same, you know, Punjabi language in Pakistan also and Punjabi language in India also. That, that is the confusion. No, no, the confusion was they didn't care. Okay. Let me tell you, let me explain to you how serious it was. Okay. I'm working in those days again with the BBC, although I'm not always working with the BBC. And, you know, very often I'm called. And when, when India's daughter enraged certain people, very stupidly, sadly, um, but when it enraged certain people, they used to, you know, lambast me as a British BBC journalist. Absolute rubbish. I've never worked for the BBC on contract or anything like that. Three mm -hmm. times they have had some funding in my film. That's it. That's my relationship with the BBC. But anyway, I have, and you know, and on this occasion also, I was working with the BBC. And when I was developing the film, David Thompson, who was then head of drama at the BBC, basically told me he would give me a pittance of funding, such a small amount of funding. I said, how are we ever going to make the film with this amount? It's just a joke. We can't do it. He said, well, the point is, this film is only going to be seen by the ghetto audience in Southall. I said, Some critics will go to see. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Some critics will going to see this film. He must be saying that. No, no. He, what no? he was saying was that only the Asian community would be interested in going to see this film. He okay, was saying huh? that because the main character who Ampuri played Yes. Was a Pakistani. Hmm. So this was racism, wasn't it not? On what basis was he telling me that a, a, a character who happens to be Pakistani or happens to be Indian or happens to be why would why would not the whole world be interested in that in going to see that film if it's a good film? Do do people who are Pakistani only go and see Pakistani films? That's racism. That is putting people into a box and saying, this is their mentality. They will. So I challenged him and actually I took the film away from the BBC. I said, you don't deserve this film. You're not gonna be you know, putting enough into this film and you don't have commitment to this film and you think this film is a niche film, goodbye. And I had to start suing the BBC actually in order to get the film away from them. Mm -hmm. And I took the film to Film 4, who was very committed to making this film. That's why you you are aloof from other director. You are the eminent personality, international eminent personality because of your guts. You well, say I'm very gutsy, that is true. Yes. I don't know about eminent, but committed certainly and honest and with integrity. And uh, I won't be pushed around by anybody. Yes. Leslie. What appeals you when you choose any idea for films? It has to move the world forward in some way. I am not interested in film as entertainment. 
I'm not saying it shouldn't be. I'm just saying let other people do that. I'm not interested in that. I've never made a film that is only about entertaining somebody. Because to me, film is the ultimate way we can connect as human beings one with the other. Film is the yes. only and most powerful journey of empathy. And empathy is the glue that sticks all good human behavior together. Beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. How else can we really know and feel what another human being is feeling? Nita Ji, Pratiba Ji, I don't know what your lives are like, but if I watch a film that takes me on the journey of who you are, whether you're both in the film or it's two films no, I'm watching with you. Know I am, I'm walking your footsteps. I'm seeing what you think, what you feel, how you act. I'm, I'm seeing and, and experiencing who you are. Yes. Now you cannot do that just theoretically. You can, of course, in a, in a novel, you can fill in the images in your imagination. And I'm not saying that books don't do empathy well. They do, of course they do. But the ultimate empathetic journey for an audience is film. Because you literally close yourself down while you're watching the film. You're not thinking about your worries and your troubles and your joys and your greed and your, you're giving yeah. yourself over to the experience of another human being. And that's a very pure and very powerful and very important journey to go on. Yes. As an audience, as a filmmaker, you feel connected with that particular subject and you choose that subject. Why your subjects are very controversial, I must ask you. Okay, so look, my film East is East, there's nothing controversial about it. It's a father. Most fathers are patriarchal. They are encouraged to be hard and dictatorial in the home. Most fathers think they rule the roost and they think they have the right to. Why? Because for centuries we've been patriarchal societies. Yes. And that is what a patriarch is, a, a male father. It means father. <laughs> it yes. comes from the Greek word father. Now, East is East should not be controversial. It's a film about tolerance. It's a film about allowing your children to be who they are, to fly to not have to be who you tell them they have to be. Because that is the way you break relationships. It's not the way you make and nurture relationships. You know, think of the number of suicides there have been because a child is forbidden by the father to do what the child's heart wants to do, right? And that child can't even reconcile. He can't live with and he can't live without he or she and commit suicide. There's a lot of that goes on, right? What kind of parenting is that? That's obscene parenting. It's disgusting, selfish parenting. We should not be cutting the wings off our children. Let's not have children if that's the way we're going to treat them. They're not asking you. <laughs> Give us birth. They're not asking you. No, Give us exactly. birth. Correct. Exactly right. Exactly. And they're not respecting you and they're not loving you and they're not being supportive of you. To say to a child, you go and do this, you know, this is what I want. <laughs> How dare you? What kind of a parent are you? And if you're if you live in a culture where that is accepted, well then the culture should change. It's not right. It's not good. So what makes my films controversial? I don't believe my films are controversial. Yes. I think that, you know, when I choose a subject. Tell me something. Let's go to the so-called most controversial of my films. Let's get right in there. India's Daughter. Why is that film controversial? You tell me. What's controversial about that film? Is it controversial to actually ask for violence against women to be stopped? Is it controversial to show you what mindset and mentality is encouraged by us? What what's controversial about it? Why was that film banned? Can anybody tell me? Why did I have to go through hell on the internet? You know, 
it's not we can say we can't say this is the film from india this is the film from from pakistan this is the universal film and uh, the subject of that film is universal it is a whole mentality of men and uh, our society it's it's kind of society we we living there live in and this film at the end of this film there are statistics which show the violence in not every country in the world because it would have gone on for an hour right and the film itself is only an hour long i didn't want to have to have a 2 hour film one hour of which is the, the 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 terrible statistics from all over the world but there are enough countries in there australia canada uk denmark usa i mean all the figures are there france and they're all disgusting there's yes. not one country in the world that has got this right yet you tell me what's controversial about that film because it is it is in universal problem you know for women yeah it is universal problem so but pratiba you have a view of my films as controversial because a moment ago you said why are your films controversial so tell me i want you to tell me you've used the word why are my films what is controversial about my films and let's discuss that what's controversial about india's daughter where's the controversy tell me no it's not about me i'm not saying that it's about the people people are saying that her films why are, are saying that? why i wish we had someone on this panel here today to voice that and explain to me why are they saying that india's daughter is a controversial film what is controversial why did the ban that film tell me that first why did the ban happen i'll tell you why the ban happened are you ready to be shocked are you ready to hear the truth about why the ban happened it wasn't the government that went to the magistrate and said ban this film it was the feminists of india who went to the magistrate and said ban this film and i can name them vrinda grover indira jai singh kavita krishnan urvashi batalia or butalia mm -hmm. dr devki jain that's who asked for the film to be banned why why did they ask for the film to be banned on the basis of selfish egoism territorialism and pretty much because the film was going to be screened on the 8th of march international women's day 2015 when they had big events that's how petty life is you know that's how hurtful and sad it is that feminists can put themselves before the problems uh, 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 that are felt by women to me that is despicable i mean from that day when i when i realized that thank god in front of many many witnesses at oxford university more than 200 students heard that that is what had happened yeah, right so when i understood that a piece of my heart died and a piece of my brain died and i gave up on any one who gives themselves labels but is a hypocrite correct and i will always tell the truth it's like for yeah it's hypocrisy you can say but uh, we are still standing on their same on same I'm sorry guys my phone I should have switched them all off it just goes non stop yeah carry on in your society in my society women uh, women are like same on same place where were they educated women or non educated yeah. women everywhere everybody not just in your society in my society exactly same. that's why i'm saying that the women position is exactly the same it is universal yeah and it hasn't changed that's also a sad thing oh. right because it's, when was the nirbhaya uh, case, we, case we we think this thing happening in hyderabad same thing happening in hathras 
Instead of saying, let's prevent this, it's unacceptable, it's obscene, it's disgusting, it's evil. Let's prevent this. And laws don't prevent at the end of the day, I'm sorry to tell you, right? Laws are overpowered by culture. Culture is much stronger than laws. You know that because of the dowry deaths and the murdering of brides and, and, and wives in order for the family, very much with collusion of the mother-in-law in many cases, right? To get more dowry, to get, we need a television. Now we need a car. I mean, they didn't give us one, killer. She accidented the tandoor, right? Let's get another bride and let's get some more dowry in. Because of all of that, the government did the right thing and banned dowry. They made dowry illegal. Do you know that dowry is illegal? Do you know that if you give dowry or take dowry, you can and should go to prison? Are you aware of that? Yes. Have families stopped taking dowry in India or giving dowry? No, they haven't. Because it's a culture. So 99%, I'd say, probably, of families still give and take dowry. That's what they've always done, and that is what they'll continue to do. So as a government, if all you're doing is putting into place laws, they'll be ignored. You're doing nothing. What you need to be doing is re-educating people. You need to start in early childhood when the attitudes are being formed in the brain. Yes. And that's all I do now. I do activism in education. I have a charity that I created as a direct response to the India's Daughter film. And I work at this 18 hours every day, seven days a week. And that's all I do. And it's my purpose in life. And for those cynical trolls out there who spent how many years, I don't know, sending me messages, you bitch, you deserve to be raped, and such lovely messages, I can tell them that in contrast to your hideous, evil, what you would call free speech, that vile, hateful, unkind, stupid comments that you have made, in contrast to that, I work my 18-hour days, seven days a week, and I don't take one rupee in salary for that yeah great leslie i wish i want to ask you that uh, when you were making the india's daughter movie what was your goal and uh, what do you think how far you achieved 
So my goal was, when I first came, I had two separate goals that, that kind of one I dropped when I was, when, when, you know, when I'd got to a certain point. The first thing I thought when I thought I'm going to make a film about this, when I first saw literally on the 17th of December, 2013, I sat there with my family in Copenhagen. We're looking at this footage and we're, I'm thinking, oh my God, I mean, this is so brutal. This is so hideous. I was raped at 18. So of course I had a sense of personal um, engagement, but, and it was a violent rape, by the way. It was a violent rape. And I remember having to feel grateful to my rapist that he didn't kill me. Well, Imagine that. Imagine having to be grateful to your rapist that he left you alive. Okay. I went to India to make this film not because of the rape. First thing I thought was, I'm going to make a campaigning film. This is going to be a film that expresses the beauty of what I see unfolding in front of me over these weeks that, uh, you know, followed the 17th announcement of the rape. These men and women pouring out onto the streets and I fell in love with them and I thought, oh my God, these protesters are fighting for me. They're fighting for women like me. And where am I in all of this? I should be out there on these protests. And then I thought, well, you know, I've got two kids and I live in another country, so it's not that easy for me to go out on the protests. And then I thought, well, I should make a film that amplifies the voices of these protesters. And the more I thought and the more I, I just thought, you know what, it's a waste of time to make a film that amplifies the voices of the protesters, because really that's jargon. What does that really mean? Well, I then thought, the only point in making this film, really the only point, is to sit in front of the rapists who did this to this girl and look into their eyes and find out what kind of human beings are these who can do this to another human being. And at that point, believe me, I was thinking, I'm going to be meeting with monsters. These men are monsters. They're psychopaths. Can you when just I share that uh, Mukesh, that guy? Yeah. He said very, very... Uh, Patriotic things about the girl. Of course. Uh, but so did his lawyers. And, and so many other people I interviewed. Mukesh Singh is quite a softly spoken, quite gentle, was, was. He was hanged three months ago, right? They hanged. Quite softly spoken, very polite, quite kind. Mm -hmm. His mother absolutely loved his mother, worshipped his mother. When I asked him what would happen if someone had done this to your sister, he said he would kill them. He would kill someone who did this to his sister. But he can do it to another girl. Why? Because he said what we taught him. We taught him that the girl who is out at night after dark is a bad girl. Mm -hmm. We taught him that if a girl is with a boy who is not her husband, her brother, her protector, she's a slut. We've taught him that. Correct. And all he did was grow up to act on the education he had from sociocultural thinking in India. Now, in the UK, the guys who go out and with their knives and gang rape and this and that, because they, they're everywhere in the world, right? They've right. been taught it the same, but slightly different because culture is different in country by country, right? Yes. But the, act is but the attitude is fundamentally the same. It's a patriarchal, patriarchal attitude that's a, that believes that women are subject to different rules and regulations different codes of dress, different, uh, but it's all man-made. It's men who decree this. Yes. Leslie, yeah. how was your experience when you were shooting in Tihar? Tihar jail, you were, you went there, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Do you want to share with us? Well, I have to tell you, I was very impressed by Tihar jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the grounds, they have um posters up saying we're we're not here to punish you we are here to rehabilitate you we are here to correct you they had workshops where 
the prisoners were encouraged to make things and to be, you know, active and useful. They had libraries. They had. I was really impressed. Now, of course, it's massively overcrowded, but that's the case in every country in the world. You have major overcrowding. There was a particular moment, I have to tell you, where I was just totally devastated, where my world came crashing down. And that was when the uh, director general called me in to her office. It was a woman, which may have had a lot to do with her giving permission. Mm -hmm. um, and she called me into her office and she was flanked by all of her male, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the head of legal, her two superintendents of the two jails that the nearby rapists were incarcerated in, her head of PR and public affairs and what have you, you know, about six men, I think, were flanking her. And she said, Leslie, I'm sorry to have to say this to you, and it's going to be a great disappointment to you, but we have to withdraw our permission for you to film and to get these interviews. Mm -hmm. And my heart dropped into the pit of my stomach. And I just thought, wait a minute. First of all, you can't withdraw, you've signed. We've signed a contract. You don't just say, oh, sorry, I've changed my mind. I'm not doing the contract. But I knew that the contract was worthless. This piece of paper was worthless if I didn't re-persuade her and re-engage her and persuade mm -hmm. these men. Because at the end of the day, a contract's only as good, like the law, as people who will implement it, right? <laughs> So basically, I took a look, and above her desk in her director general office is a portrait of Gandhiji. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know what, I've got nothing, nothing to lose here because I've already just lost everything in what she's told me. And I went to India with my own money, right? The BBC did not get involved in this film until the end of the year in which I made it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a penny from the BBC until December 2013. The rape was in December 2012. And I went to India, I think it was in the March of 2013. So for all those months, I'm filming, hiring people. That obviously, you money from that my time, own. Sorry? That time we, we met in one festival, film festival, with Aditra and all. Okay, I, I, I mean, my it was so long ago that, of course, I don't know if I remember so much, but you know, I, um, I was making the film on my own coin. And with, with her words, when she said, it's over, we're not letting you carry on, I just went, oh my God, how can I have just lost everything, you know, and not just for me, but for the film and the change and the, everything I wanted to do. And I just looked each one of them in the eyes. And I basically, I alluded to the, post, the um, picture of Gandhiji and I said, listen, what we're doing here is too important for you to just say that and, and get away with just leaving it there. And I looked at all their eyes and I said, you know, what is clear to me here is, I can see in your eyes who wants to carry on and who is actually telling the DG to stop this. Correct. And I can see that the DG wants to continue. Mm -hmm. But you all want to stop it. And what a coincidence that you all, every single one of you, are men. And she is the only woman. And why does she want to continue? Because she and I, as women, and, and the daughters and mothers, and I use the language they understand, right? Or the language they use, which is the kind of patriarchy that, that makes women into functions, into roles in the family, for example, right? I said, we have everything to lose and you have nothing to lose. Correct. That's why you're telling her to stop. And she dismissed them. She asked them to leave the office. And she asked me to sit down while she made some very serious phone calls. I'm not going to go into the details of them. But by the end of about two and a half hours of my sitting there waiting, staring into Gandhiji's eyes and just praying <laughs> to his spirit to bring this back online because it was so important, she then said, okay, you go ahead. I'm satisfied. That was it. Great. Great. You could convince her. <laughs> Leslie, I one one more thing I want to ask you. 
you are human right activist why you thought to be one when you were your uh, career was so bright in cinema because i would never be able to look myself in the face again having made that film india's daughter having realized what i realized which is that the world will never change not one aspect of this terrible world we are living with which i'm sorry to say is the truth is it's a man made world it's a world that is the product of male decisions we go to war because men deem that to be the thing we should be doing take a look at what happens when women govern countries take a look at new zealand take a look at denmark they all have women prime ministers and women leaders women don't send their flesh and blood into wars to be killed we don't do that because we are nurturers we love we don't sit there and hate nor do we play like boys with toys and say oh let's spend several trillions of dollars on going up to the moon i'm sorry what the hell are we doing really when our people are starving when there are poverty issues that are unthinkable when there are caste issues that are unthinkable and gender based violence issues that are unthinkable and yes. racial systemic racism and racial issues what the hell are we doing spending trillions on playing around with toys we'll go to the moon look how clever we are go to hell actually change the world get us some get us some decency in human relationships start taking care of human beings stop killing little girls just because you think they're worthless i mean it is a disgusting world we're in and it's driven by the male mentality and i cannot live with that i can't go and make another film and turn my attention to another subject when i know how to solve the problem now I don't care if you think I'm insane, arrogant, uh whatever. I know how to solve this problem and I'm solving it. And currently I'm with 77, sorry. We went up last week to 89,200 children mm -hmm. in 16 countries in the world. That's the only reason for me to be alive and continue to be alive. And I will do this with my dying breath. Of course I will be an activist. because the alternative is to collude and collaborate with the worst decisions that are being made in my name not in my name mm -hmm. that's really wonderful wonderful yeah. yeah well it is what it is i mean honestly i swear to you when i hear people you know thanking me for what i do or saying it doesn't it, it doesn't compute in my brain i think it's just i'm compelled to do this i don't deserve thanks honest to god i don't deserve thanks i don't deserve anything special i just this is me this is who i am this is my understanding it's the point i've come to of realization and i can't not do it you know you can thank someone when they're making a conscious effort and a difficult decision they're saying i i've got this path or this path which path shall i take let me take the good path then i think those people are worthy of thanks but i'm not worthy of thanks because i haven't chosen because i can't choose i'm compelled i'm doing what my karma is if you like or what i have to do this is my path in life and i'm following it so i can't do anything else there are some questions from uh, this thing uh, audience please please let's get stuck in some of Finally, those india has got justice after struggle of 8 years and uh, vinita no 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 sorry pratibha i didn't hear that say that again okay finally india's daughter got justice after struggle of 8 years no she didn't okay why you think like that because when i asked mukesh singh now that you've got the death penalty for rape now that you're going to hang mm -hmm. men are going to stop raping right because they're going to look at this case and say oh my god now they're giving hanging for rape 
So I'm not going to take the chance because I don't want to hang. He looked at me. He had a smile on his face. His mm. gentle face, gentle face. Okay. Can you imagine me saying that about him? It's true. Mm. I will tell you the truth. I'll tell everyone the truth, always. Mm. He had a smile on his gentle face and he said to me, now, <laughs> now that there's a death penalty for rape, they'll just kill the girls after they've raped them so that they can't identify us. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about justice? Who got justice? We've lost her. She was the brightest, most extraordinary, intelligent, beautiful young woman, feisty spirit. I know all about her from her best friend who refused, by the way, to come on camera because her father and brother forbade her even to come and speak up for her best friend because they were worried that if she's in a film that deals with a rape victim, she will also be dishonored. Really, come on, what are we talking about here? She has not got justice. She will not get justice until and unless every single Anganwadi in India teaches our children gender equality from the age of three while their brains are still developing. There is no other way to achieve justice for Nirbhaya, for any of the other victims, and you know how many millions there are in the world. And this is of every country. That's why we're global. There's another question about uh, Vinita Tyagi is asking. Ask her what is next subject in her mind to make a movie on any Indian subject. There is no next subject for me. Um, is it Vinita, did you say, who asked the question? Yes, Vinita. Vinita, I can't make another film. I will never make another film. I love films, right? They're in my DNA, they're in my blood, I miss them. But I will never make another film as long as I live. Because what I'm doing is what will make the difference to our next generation and our children. Films will never do that. But still, people are really hopeful about films, you know? Like Good. me. Good, and I'm glad because I was hopeful about films. But for me personally, I can't make another film because what I'm doing is much more important and will lead to change. So I'm not saying don't make films. Thank God you're out there making films. What would I do if I didn't have your films to watch? <laughs> because I made one film on uh, this uh, Hyderabad Incident. Good for you. Thank you for making that, Pratiba. It's critical that we keep doing that. Only I can't. I just can only be honest for myself and for me, you see. I've made enough films. I'm old now. I leave it to the young ones. I just have to make change, not films. But you are a very eminent director, Leslie. You should make films. I don't mean anything, darling. It doesn't your mean identity it. as a filmmaker, you know. What and does I, that mean? I, it doesn't mean anything. At the end of the day, we all die. We all, from dust to dust, from ashes to ashes, you know, eminence is for this period of time, but change is forever. Yes. So beautifully said. Okay. So beautifully said, yes. Leslie, yeah. um, I want to know about your, your what is this think equal? Can you elaborate and tell us more about it? I'd love to. I'd love to. Look, Think Equal, it's very, very simple. It is a tangible prescription. So it's a prescriptive program like a vaccination to prevent discrimination and violence and emotional dysregulation and selfishness and greed. Look. Two quotes I want to give you. First of all, Gandhiji. Gandhiji said, if we want real peace in the world, we will have to start with the children. And he was so right. Because at a certain point of brain development, do you know that 90% of the adult brain, the same brain I have in my head now, 90% of it was fully formed by the age of five. When I was five. And in certain respects, if we want to put in the foundation 
for emotional literacy, being able to recognize emotions, how people are feeling, read their faces, recognize how we are feeling, know how to deal with big feelings like anger, not hit out, but know how to control those feelings and why they are there. Well, we need to do that and all that foundation. If we want to teach our children empathy, we have to get into the developing brain and co-construct the physical neuro pathways in the brain with our children before the age of six. It has to be before that age if we want to lay a foundation. Now, people get very cross with me when I say that because they say, what do you mean? You're giving up on everyone above the age of six? I'm not. It's like with films. I'm saying you go and make these wonderful films, but I won't. So I say, Thank God there are many great organizations and uh, NGOs who are working with children above six, with adults, with youth. But I'm not going to do that because hardly anyone is working with the little ones. And just as I believe an architect should never build a building from the ground floor up, we know, we're, the engineers and architects in the world know you have to build foundations. Yes. So why aren't we building foundations for our children? Why are we leaving it to faith? Look, I have to tell you something from the heart and very honestly. When I sat in front of those rapists and murderers who I interviewed for 31 hours over several weeks, and you know, I didn't just interview the Nirbhaya rapists, I interviewed some others. I interviewed one guy called Gorov, who I sat with for three hours, and he had raped a five-year-old girl, right? Now, let me tell you, when I sat and looked into their eyes and understood who these men were, because you do in that amount of time when you're asking 150 questions and looking into their eyes, right? What I understood was that they didn't have a chance in hell of growing up and not raping. That's the problem, because we've taught them to do it. Mm -hmm. We have taught them. So how can we then say, oh, nothing to do with us, rotten apples in the barrel, rubbish. The barrel is rotten and we are the barrel. And all the fine words and jargon in the world Betty Bachao, Betty Parao, it won't make a difference until and unless we start teaching our children from the earliest age to respect and love everybody. The second quote I want to uh, uh, bring up the spirit of the other Gandhi from the other continent, Nelson Mandela, who said education, which is what the Think Equal program is, it's an education program for the early years, three to six, and that's it. And Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. Yes. Well, what did he mean by education? Believe me, he did not mean counting, writing, literacy, numeracy, rubbish. That's all about the labor markets, nothing to do with being a decent human being. Here's what he meant. He said, no child is born hating another human being because the color of their skin, their gender, their religion, any other background, their caste, a child has to be taught to hate. Yes. And if he can be taught to hate, he can be taught to love. Well, that's what Think Equal is. Think Equal teaches our children to love, to respect each and every one of us, people and planet, we have books called Loving Earth, I Love My Planet. We teach them to recycle from the age of three. We teach them why it's important to not use plastic because that goes into the oceans and kills the little fish. Mm -hmm. And when we teach the children this from the earliest age, they understand. When we show our children occupation cards that they have to match up, the girl astronaut with the boy astronaut, the male father feeding the baby with the female mother feeding the baby. This is how human relationships should be. The fact that we've had patriarchy pervert human relations and make them into obscene, selfish, greedy, vile relations doesn't mean we should carry on putting up with it. 
but we have to start realistically where we can make the change. That's what Think Equal is. It's a vaccination, preventative. Social information. Social and emotional, correct, absolutely. And we have books. We do this with narrative picture books, which are our little films, you see. The way film is an empathetic journey, so is a book for a little child. The characters and the journey they go on, and I wish I had some of them right here in front of me so I could, yes, I do, yes. Give me one second, I'm coming right back, okay? So, here we have some. Ah, uh, yeah. Right, so we have, you remember I mentioned there was a book called I Love My Planet? Here it is. Yes. Here it is. And we created these books, and look, we see children from all over the world. They're all different looks and all different colors, and right? Okay, My Special Hair. This is a book about a girl who has incredibly curly hair. It's so curly, it's fantastic. Flowers grow in it. And she can put crayons in it and birds nest in it, and it's fantastic. It's all about diversity, how we feel. This is from a Sri Lankan author. Uh, uh, Sybil Vettisinger, who's one of the best Sri Lankan uh, illustrators, artists, writers. And look at these fantastic characters that she draws. Okay. We do it also with resources. I'm going to show you just one of our resources. This is a resource. It's actually quite important from the point of view of India, where you have colorism, right? In India, you have the real problem of women to, you know, particularly women, to use whitening cream, right? Why? Because that is thought to be beautiful. And it's thought to be white. We ask our little children, we use this resource with a book, a particular book called Me, Myself and I, where we're teaching our kids to love themselves, self-esteem. And we ask our little ones at three, this girl here, look, she's similar color to me, right? What color is she and what color am I? And the kids will all say white, right? Mm -hmm. So the teacher will then say, because in the teacher's lesson plans, which we also give the teacher, lesson plan booklet, the teacher gets 90 lesson plans for each year of Think Equal, three a week for 30 weeks, and the resources and the books, and then the teacher has a full kit, prescriptive, all the teacher has to be able to do is follow the instructions and read. Okay, so now we say to the kids, so if, if this girl here is white, right. can anybody tell me what color is the page on the side of her face? It's white. <laughs> ah, I agree. I also think this is white. But listen, if that's white, how can she be white? Because aren't they different colors? <coughs> There's a problem here, my friends. We're calling her white, we're saying I'm white, but look, the paper is different from my hand. Let's look at this little girl here in the middle. What color is she? And everyone in the class, all the little ones will say black because that's what we've taught them. We've taught them that she's black. Now the teacher says, okay, my friends, if this little girl is black, who can tell me what color is her hair? And they will say, black. So if her hair is black, how can her skin possibly be black? It's not black. It's different. And what we've just proven to the children, and then we go on and do some more exercises with a brown crayon, coloring in one hand in dark brown, one hand in light brown, uh, one hand in black, one hand in white, and we test again. And then we prove to the children, we say, look, every single one of us is brown because the brown matches, dark brown matches her, and the light brown matches her, but every one of us is brown. We're just different shades of brown. Correct. We're one brown family. Do you see how important that is to put into the child's head when the brain is developing and understanding the world? So that's how Think Equal works. It's very prescriptive. You would not, with a vaccination against COVID, open it up and say, hey, guys, anybody who wants to create a vaccination, feel free, help yourself. Uh, you know, 
take the advice of that idiot Trump who says, uh, put in a bit of disinfectant, a bit of this, a bit of that. Really? Really? <laughs> okay. We give it to our scientists who know what they're doing. And we say, you decide what has to go into this mixture, this vaccination that will rid us of COVID-19. You decide how many doses to give because you know you're experts. Well, we've done the same with Think Equal. We've taken the experts from all around the world. From India, we've got Dr. Urvashi Sami, who is a genius. Empowering girls through education is her big uh, um, expertise. We took Sir Ken Robinson, who is the giant who ever walked the earth, a man with a mind so extraordinarily vast and amazing. I worship the ground he, he walked on because sadly he left us two months ago, he died. But his work will live on in this world in a way that is extraordinary, as I hope mine will, that's, you know. And I'm here just serving Sir Ken Robinson's legacy. He's the real mastermind, that, you know. So that's what we do, that's what Think Equal is. And of course, you can go on our website and um, help us in any way you can, you know, raise funds for us. Okay. Every penny of that we raise goes to children, uh, to, to bringing on more and more children. Right now, you know, we're with this 89,000. Um, we are looking at expanding massively in the Eastern Cape, bringing on another 99,400 kids in January, you know. We need help. We need support. This is the work that needs to be done for us to change our world. Yes, social change is very important. It From is. Childhood. It is. Yeah, somebody is asking, Venita Tyagi is asking, boys in India or anywhere need to, to be taught the equality right from the day one. I couldn't agree more. But listen, we must be careful about just putting this all onto boys because girls also have to be taught equality from day right. one. They need, because as you rightly said earlier, one of you, Nita or Pratiba, I can't remember who, but one of you said, the women are also colluding in this. They're programmed as well. Of course they are. It's the men who program us to keep us there. Right? But the thing is, we also, you know, when I say we teach gender equality in our Think Equal program, it's not only our girls that we are teaching equality. It's also our boys for our boys' sake, because you know what? Our boys are being brought up to be crippled emotionally and in their psyche. And you know that in the UK where I live, the number one killer of young men, young boys, is suicide. It's not drugs or alcohol or motor car accidents. It's suicide. Why? Because we're bringing up our boys and saying to them, man up, don't cry like a girl. Boys, don't cry. You're responsible for the whole family. You have to go out. You have to. We're crushing them. We're killing them. It's not just our girls that we're doing wrong to. It's our boys also. So we have to, as a world, come together now and not be divisive. And, you know, this is why when I. I mean, I really paused before I thought, am I going to announce on this program that it was the feminists of India? Yes, I am. I'll tell you why. Because the individuals I've mentioned, it's not about them being feminists. This is not about us versus you. This is about good human beings and bad human beings. And there are great feminists and there are bad feminists. And I'm sorry to say the women who I have mentioned, acted badly. I'm not saying they're bad women. They've done extraordinary amounts of work in India for women. But in this instance, they acted selfishly, territorially, and bloody stupidly. Okay. And I will say that out loud because it's the truth. Correct. Yes. Leslie, can you describe yourself in one word, your strength and your weakness okay my strength is my passion my weakness is my passion okay <laughs> it's the truth it leads me into a lot of trouble okay. but it also without it i can't do what i'm doing so like my family my husband always says to me, you're black and white, you're too black and white, you know. 
are someone's either bad or they're good or they're be more human, be more. But the thing is, <laughs> it's that same passion that drives me to do the right thing and to do good that makes me go, you idiot, how could you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's very bad, very, very bad, and very, very good. But I'm honest about my weakness. That's it. The older I get, the harder it is to change. That's the real problem, right? That's why we have to start young. They didn't start young enough with me. <laughs> Leslie, what message you want to give out to the world on this BIFF 2020 platform? Listen, there's only one message I want to give out and only one message I care about. In our failed education system that is not fit for purpose, we have the solution to change the world for the better. Anything you care about, do you care about climate change? Do you care about the planet? Do you care about violence against women? Do you care about reducing men to terrified wrecks that go and jump off cliffs and commit suicide because they've had too much pressure put on them. Whatever you care about, there's only one way to solve it, and that is through the education system. But the problem is we've got the subject that can do that is missing. It's not there. We've only gone for numeracy and literacy and testing. That is only about the labor market. And what I say to education ministers is the message I want to give to the world. And it's as simple as this. How can you, education minister, or you, Narendra Modi, who have a duty of care in your job, you have a duty of care to your youngest citizens, how can you deem it compulsory for them to learn numeracy and literacy in a world in which we have calculators and spell checks and computers, but it's optional for them to learn how to value another human being? Humanity. It's optional for them to learn how to lead healthy relationships. This cannot be optional. Make that subject compulsory and watch your country prosper. Watch well-being flourish and watch the change you want to see in the world actually take place. That's it. I have no other message. Correct. Great message. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Can I go and eat my lunch? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was very nice, Leslie, to have you on this show, BIF of 2020. And uh, it was really our pleasure to have you like you know such a wonderful person and uh, we wish you all the best as you are doing such a great work and yes. i i'm sure that you are inspiring so many other people so i have but on that, on that thing also uh, leslie why don't you make small small films for children because what i'm doing with children takes every waking minute of my life. And making even a small film, as you know, takes time. And I don't have time. I only have time for my lesson plans, my books, for spreading this to more and more and more countries and getting a version that we can put into refugee settings because this has not been trauma-informed and we now are doing a trauma-informed version and we're doing a home kit version so that parents and families can have it at home. All of this, by the way, is on the Think Equal website. Please go there, www.thinkequal.org. Org. And it's all there, and you'll find also some free materials. And please, please go there, you know. But this is why I can't make another film because I don't have the time to. I only have time for this. This is my first and only love, and that's the end of my life when I finish with this love. Okay? <laughs> and last thing I want to say to all of you thank you very much for inviting an ex filmmaker, as it turns out, onto your BIFF panel. And I very much enjoyed. And Nebohot uh, Kushui or Yemera Sob Hagyahe. Do you want to say anything you, you want to? 
add on to this like your hindi lines so then we would love to yeah, hear no hindi from me okay let me let me show off now my hindi okay hum to loot gaye barbaad ho gaye no was good awesome <laughs> that no more <laughs> don't think we can't go further <laughs> thank you so much lesley thank you all all the very best to everybody take care i love thank india me bharat bahut bahut pyar hai bahut pyar hai let's get our children let's really give the children the right they have to positive outcomes in life let us yes. stop seeing our children grow up and raping etc all the other evils okay take care everybody lots of love you too bye right. thank you thank you very much